Dreamer's Den, a podcast about daring to dream, with host Brad Robbins. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Dreamer's Den, podcasting today from Dreamer's Den HQ. Whether you're listening, uh, wherever you get your podcasts, or watching via video on YouTube, we're glad that you're here. I'm joined today by the brilliant budgeter and business owner, productivity specialist, and probably my two favorite, the kitchen dancing enthusiast and fellow nacho aficionado, Jordan Dude, Page. Nachos? How I do I not know this about love you? love nachos. Oh, why are we here, Brad? So here's Let's the thing. Let's go get nachos. It's not just nachos. It's anything Mexican. Okay. So when we're out okay. on the road touring, like I kid you not, it's like we see some fancy like Italian restaurant that we can't pr- mm-hmm. pronounce. It's like, eh. We see like a sign that's like been like hand painted. Hey, yes, it's like tacos. half hanging. Yes, sign us up. Yeah, I'm like, there. One hundred percent. Like I, I will take three orders of whatever is melted with cheese on it. Yes, one hundred percent. Yeah, that is my Mexican food is my love language. Okay, well we question. need to compare like restaurants after this. I have a list. Uh, I want all of them. Okay. Yeah, one hundred percent. And then I want to also start with a random fact that that you sent me ahead of time. You I'm really nervous because I don't know what exactly was sent ahead of time, but let's see. Well, whether you or your team or whoever okay. sends it, you won twenty five thousand oh. dollars on a match game. Yeah, I sure did. With Alec Baldwin, we're best friends. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm the. Here's the irony: I was terrible. I was like one of the worst contestants I think they've ever had, but I was paired up with the. Most, I was second worst ever and he was the worst ever. So I got on to the final round by one point. I only earned one point the entire game. And then I got on the final round and happened to match the winning question. And I got 25 grand. Was this a TV show? It's a TV show. (gasps) Brad. What show? Oh my gosh. It's called The Match Game. I've never seen The Match Game. Okay. My dad, I grew up on old game shows. So we're talking like $100,000 Pyramid and um, what's the one that's like, no whammies. Anyway, all of those. Yeah, big, big money, no whammy. Yes, yeah, and yeah. all of those. And Family Feud, but the old, old, old versions. So I got an email that they were casting for Match Game. And I'm like, I know Match Game. I would rock at Match Game. I watched it before. Anyway, so I auditioned and I got on. And first of all, do not Google it because it is very <laughs> inappropriate. I will not let my grandparents watch it. It's super inappropriate. Didn't exactly expect that. But, um, you know, after taxes, we came home with like $5 and yeah. it was fun. Cool. What, but you know what? It's a fact on a podcast. So I feel like it was worth it. And aside, I mean, second only to the nacho yeah. fact. Yeah. But did they film in LA? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was fun. That's amazing. It was so fun. How long did you have to go out there to do that? It was like, I was there like two days. So. Okay. That's amazing. Really long days. It was fun. So I don't know. I mean, if you, if anyone knows of any random inappropriate game shows out there looking for someone like call me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, so I want to start off with a little bit of a backstory of, of how you and I met. Cause like, this is, this is the brilliant thing about the internet, right? Is like you, you become familiar with people and meet people and, and you almost form this bond before you've even met ever even in person. Uh Yeah. Do you remember the first time that we actually met face to face? Was it at the Johnson Pile yes. show? Which is funny because we had been friends for years before years, that. Literally Because I had been to probably half a dozen or more of your shows and had followed you online for a long time. So it's weird. It's I just weird. remember meeting you and thinking like, okay, like she's not some AI robot. Like <laughs> it's a real person. Isn't it weird? Yeah. I know. Did you, was I taller or shorter than you expected? Honestly, and this this was actually surprising, like exactly what I imagined. Oh my gosh. Yeah, most people when they meet me, they're like, whoa, you're a giant. I don't know, I must look shorter online, but yeah. I guess I'm tall. I no, it, it was exactly what I had in my mind. But what I've loved in addition to just like getting to know you over social media and whatnot has been diving into your story a little bit. And that's what I wanna start with today okay. is I want to hear more about the backstory of how Jordan Page, the Page Company, and so on and so forth, like came to be. Like walk us through the beginning. Oh gosh. Well, it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> no, I don't even know where to begin, Brad. And this is what's crazy is my story is an evolution that is still evolving and it was not intentional. So I'm probably very different than some people that you will have come on your show that were like, I always knew. I was going to be a performer or always knew I was going to be fill in the blank. Uh, 
no, this all happened by accident in spite of me. And it's been cool, but I've always been two steps behind trying to play catch up with this motion that has just happened organically. So I guess if I could, if it's possible to summarize in two minutes, it would be that um, I was always frugal, but when I got married and as newlyweds, we were trying to figure out this weird balance of who who pays what and who's managing what. My husband's name is Bubba. It's actually his name. And his mom took care of the money in his family. And my dad took care of the money in my family. So even just figuring out that weird dynamic, um, we came to learn really quickly that we were terrible at budgeting. Just no one had really taught us, but we were we were frugal and used coupons going to dinner and never paid full price for anything. We would pat ourselves on the back. We were like actually cutting out coupons. Like paper. sometimes I was never an extreme couponer. Okay. That's, but, that's like a, that's like its own industry. I feel like, I don't know if it's still a thing, but I remember there were like TV shows about extreme like the couponing. binders. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, I mean, I would never throw away junk mail. Those things were valuable. You know, all the little, yes. And the calendars that have all the little perforated coupons. Okay. Yes. I was a bit of a coupon hoarder, but that's besides the point. We, I think our awakening was ultimately when my husband quit his job to start a business. And anyone who's self-employed knows that that is a trip. It's like insurance goes out the window, yeah. your stable paycheck goes out the window. And no matter how dedicated you are, no, no matter how hard you work, it's not always up to you as to what the paycheck looks like. And as the boss, you pay yourself last. So um, we went through a transition for sure where we had this really stable income. And as anyone who knows who starts a business, it takes a minute to yeah. make some money at that business. So we were living off of hopes and dreams for a while and credit cards ultimately. And we racked up credit card debt really fast. And it was scary because I was like, but we clip coupons. <laughs> this isn't how it's supposed to work. Um, long story short, I went online looking for help. Well, I tried talking to people in person. And back in the day, you did not talk about money. That was mm -hmm. awkward. You didn't even talk about how much you pay your babysitters. It was just this hush-hush conversation. So no one, none of my friends or family would help. And then online, it was a bunch of old white guys that were teaching me, I don't know, investment strategies and Roth IRAs. And well, and not only that, but but just the the idea of investing, at least, at least to me, like as a as a 20-something year old, like seemed so foreign because there was no access. Like you had right. to call a brokerage yes. and it was like this, this professional world that I knew nothing about. And, yeah. and now you can literally invest like by connecting. Oh, my a, kid a invests. Card. He has like yeah. an app and we like gave him some money. He like checks his stocks. I'm like, you are literally smarter than me and you are 13. But back in then, 2007, eight, nine, 10, um, it was just different. Anyway, I, I was like, okay, listen, I don't want to hear about investing. Tell me about Target. Like, can I go to Target? Can I go on vacation with my family? How do I do this? And I just made up my own systems and I'm terrible at budgeting. I'm not good with math. I had never taken a personal finance class. It literally was just find a need, fill a need, I guess. And it worked really fast. We had racked up. I mean, we had over $10,000 just on one credit card, plus a car we couldn't afford, plus, plus, plus. And we were able to get out of all that debt in 13 months. And he had only brought home like $31,000 that first year. We were not making much. So um, it worked and it worked fast. And then I found myself, and I'm sure you can relate to this, when you get excited about something, you just want to share it. Yeah. And it's, I wasn't trying to sell anything or build anything or make a business. I just was so excited that it worked for me. And I was like, you guys, this is actually like fun. I mean, budgeting is still stupid, but like, it's really fun in a way. <laughs> and so then I kind of started writing about it on this family blog and decided to make that private and put it on a blog that I called fun, cheap or free. And that's really the beginning of the end is I started this little blog and the blog spot days. And it just organically just started taking off. And after a year and a half, Bubba put this little thing on there called Google Analytics. And I found out that there were hundreds of thousands of people reading my blog. And he was like, uh, we need to put some AdSense on that thing. And so we did. And then it just kind of grew. And I hired an assistant to help. And then I started speaking more. And I started teaching people one-on-one. -on -one, and then teaching small groups, then huge groups, then giant groups, and then put it online. And then YouTube came about and I put it on YouTube and 
here we are sitting at that. a podcast well, in the and, dreamer's den. Yeah. In, in the dreamer's den. And not only that, but you were, you were dubbed the fun, cheap or free queen appearing <laughs> on shows like the today show, Rachel Ray, TLC and good morning America. I mean, yeah. that's, that's yeah. pretty amazing. Again, it was really fun. It kind of was one of those things that I thought, okay, wow, people need to hear this. And I had imposter syndrome. I mean, I still have it. Like as of five minutes ago, I still have imposter syndrome where I'm like, wait, wait, but I, 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 I don't know anything about investing and I don't, I've never taken a class. I don't know, but I had to really strip away from that mindset and be like, you know what? I have ideas that work for me. And if they could work for me or inspire me, perhaps they could help somebody else. And if it could help one more person, then why wouldn't I put myself out there and be vulnerable and share it? And it's been a process. But now where we are today is I've started the page company and we've got a whole team and two warehouses and we have um, some planners and cookbooks and then a, a bunch of digital courses and content. And I refuse to ever stop blogging. Even though people don't do it anymore, I feel like there's too many things out there where you have to pull out your credit card to get the value. And I just want to keep making free content because that's what got me here in the first place. So I think that's really fun. cool. Kind of staying true to, to what got you to where you are in a way, you know, and, and the idea of, of, you know, just starting something from nothing, not because you had any intention of it turning into what it is today, I think, but, but rather out of number one, a need, which clearly mm -hmm. there was a need yeah. to like, you know, change some financial behavior, start doing things a little differently, but also just because it, just being authentic, it's like, you know what, this helped me. There's 7 billion people in the world. There's probably someone else out there in a similar situation that this could help. Yeah. And and you know even that that notion, I mean we talk all the time on this show about daring to dream. Daring to dream does not mean that everything comes together perfectly in the right place at the right time with the proper funding and the right management team around you, like that's not how it works. That was the origin story of Gentry. It was not that people put us together. It was that literally we're sitting around a table one day, Casey's wife walks in and says, you guys should form a boy band. And we're like, how? Like, will anyone even come? Will anyone even buy a ticket? And then we just celebrated our, our nine year anniversary wow. this month. That's awesome. And looking back um, on what we've accomplished, it's just because we decided to move forward. Yeah. And, and none of us, when I remember being in the recording studio, none of us felt like recording artists. Like it was weird to even consider ourselves that. It's like, we're just dudes singing into microphones. <laughs> it's like, no, no, you're a recording artist. And then yeah. seeing it chart on Billboard, seeing seeing shows actually start to move tickets. And it wasn't just like our family and our moms at the show. It's like, like strangers yeah. saw an ad and came and it was just like, okay, like there's something about having a dream, following that dream, figuring out along the way yeah. that I think resonates with a lot of people. Yeah, and not feeding the imposter syndrome monster. You know, every person with an idea or a voice or an opinion or a dream deserves the right to share that no matter your accreditation or regardless of whether you've been in a recording studio or not. And I think luckily, I think today, I don't know if you would agree with this, but 2023, I feel like is the year of not just the year of, but we are in a season of um, scrappiness that you don't feel like you have to, we were actually just talking about this. You don't have to have your, your mile long degree and your leather briefcase and your tie. In some cases you do, of course, but in order to make a difference. And um, it's kind of cool. It's, it's fun to watch for sure. So I, I would imagine that a, a common thread with anyone who has gone out, had built and seen to come like come to fruition a dream, they had to they had to do the uphill battle of imposter syndrome. Right. What 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 has it taken you to overcome that? Oh man, are we entering a therapy session currently? Is that what's happening? I mean, you're going to send me a yeah. bill. Yes. The, the, the chair actually. Leans if I need back. to recline. <laughs> oh, I still battle it every day. I think the hardest thing for me right now is I feel like I'm very sure of my voice and um, my talents and my message and um, my God-given skills that I'm so happy to share with people. I think for me, my imposter syndrome right now is tricky with the landscape of social media because that has been in the past, it's just been very natural and organic. People just find my content if they like it and they stick around and things are just different now. And I'm really trying to um, not compare myself 
to kind of the TikTok generation that's coming up. And, um, and anyway, so I think it is something that you battle every day. That being said, I would say the things that help are for me keeping my why in mind. And I love this as before we started the podcast, I asked you simple questions, even like, tell me about the yellow and the green. And you had an answer for everything. And I think it's the intention behind what you do. That's so important with any project, any creation, any dream is why am I doing this? Otherwise, as I'm sure you see all the time with artists, musicians, people online, they're just like chasing the virality. They're trying to chase the fame. They're trying to chase the clicks and the likes, and you will always fall short. I feel like you have to just go in with blinders on and be like, this is my message. This is what God wants me to do. This is why I'm here. And I hope it works. And if it doesn't, then I guess that's what was meant to happen too. So it's a lot of centering, a lot of like putting the phone away, a lot of keeping people in your corner that will keep you humble, you know, having a team that will trust you, but also keep you on course, I think is really what it is though. It's still a daily challenge for sure. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And and that was, that was one of the questions that I wanted to ask you. And we'll frankly probably ask everyone that comes on this show is, is tell me your why, because I just think that you cannot be successful without really understanding what that is, because it's too hard to be consistent. It's too hard to deal with the naysayers, the negative comments, the criticism that inevitably comes with, with any level of success. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that's so important. And that's what I fall back on every single time when things get hard, when I get tired is like understanding why am I doing this? We have so many choices every day. I've chosen to do this thing. So if I don't understand why I chose to do it, then yeah, I'm going to quit. I'm going to give up immediately. That's awesome. Well, so from from the budget boot camp and your productivity boot camp and shelf cooking, the cookbook, what am I leaving out? Oh. Um, there's gotta be more things. I also have a couple of kids and I uh, think that counts. Eight of them to be exact. I got eight kids, guys. I got eight kids. I don't know, we do a lot at PageGo. My goal is to build stronger families. That's why I do it. And then we really focus on budgeting, productivity and frugal cooking, which do you wanna know It's funny? Those are my three biggest pain points in life. Those are the three biggest weaknesses I have. I'm not good at any of them. And yet here I am because I feel like if I can figure out something that works for me, then clearly it could work for anyone. So. And, and I feel like as an outsider watching you figure this all out, it's like, okay, if she can do all that with eight kids, <laughs> I could probably figure it out with one. You know what? One was actually the hardest for me, actually maybe two. So I think eight gets easier in a way, but not comparing. Well, so. it, it's amazing. Thank you. It, I appreciate it's, it's, that. It's truly amazing to watch you do what you do. So I want to transition now to a segment that I have deemed the thrifty toolbox. <gasps> Ooh. I feel like this is going to be right up your alley. Okay. Okay. I'm, so I'm here's here. what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a couple of different scenarios and it's all going to make sense here when I get to it in a moment, but I want you to give me your initial response to what you would tell this given individual living in this situation. Okay. We're going to start with a food preparation scenario. Okay. okay. All right. So I don't want to suggest that I had someone in mind when I said this one, <laughs> but let's just assume someone out there eats Hy out. Hypothetically hypothetical, speaking. Yes. Okay. Certainly not referring to myself. Someone eats out all the time because they just don't have time. Right. Right. To cook. How can they hack meals to not only save themselves time, but also money? Mm -hmm. Again, it goes back to the why. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, um, okay, I'm backtracking. I'm not very good at answering concisely, but sometimes when people find out that I am a bit of a budgeting expert, did you see me shrinking away from that? I still have imposter syndrome. I am a budgeting expert. And when people find out, they look at me and they say, oh, I need to be better at budgeting. And I want to say to them like, but why? You know what I mean? Why, why otherwise you're just going to clip a couple of coupons and it's going to get frustrating and you'll quit and move on. And I think it's the same with the food is I think you have to have a why behind it first. So are you trying to save money? Do you need to get healthier? Um, are you trying to set a better example for your kids? So pick, pick something first. And then second of all, there's so many easy things you can do. And I would say the number one thing would be pick a day. I'm, I'm pretending this person's name is rad and rad. Maybe you could Sounds familiar. on a Sunday, Sounds like a nice guy too. Yeah. I am awesome. Just order some groceries to be delivered. I'm okay with the delivery fee, like tip that driver worth it and have them come on Saturday. Don't even go to a grocery store, Brad, because one baby step at a time, have them delivered. And then on Sunday, take 30 minutes and just chop everything up. 
and like chop the veggies, maybe roast them all at once, grill up a bunch of chicken, pick pick like three meals that you'd be okay eating a couple of times and just take a minute and prep them. And then that 30 minute, maybe 60 minute investment will pay off for the whole week. And also with that, be sure to schedule in eating out. You need your queso, Brad. Mm -hmm. So I think you also reward yourself by saying, if I can avoid eating out Monday through Friday this week, then I'm going to go out on Saturday and have the best meal of queso and nachos, both. And that's like a reward. And so it's not just saying, oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. It's making it possible, setting a reward for yourself, and then rinse and repeat. And you can do it. I I know you can. Also, you need to have a very deep love affair with your slow cooker. So we'll talk about that later. Or in my case, it would be my Traeger grill. Traeger. Yeah. Okay, but Traeger's like, oh yeah, you, oh you, you're a grill master. Yeah. That's right. I don't, I don't know if I'd say master, but I love to smoke meats on the Traeger. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yes. And I here's agree what's with interesting. That. Can I bring myself to prepare a meal that might take 45 minutes? No. Can I cook a pork for 10 hours? Yes. And here's why. There's joy I know behind my, it. I know my why. Mm-hmm. Because there's nothing more satisfying than shredding that pork and watching people eat it and be like, this is amazing. Okay, we are gonna blend both dreams. You ready for this? I'm ready. Smoke a big old pork butt on Sunday or whatever meat you want and then turn it into a couple of different things throughout the week so it's a win-win. You find so much joy in preparing it and guess what? You can even do like a brisket and a pork and chicken all at the same time and then there you go. And then freeze the extras and I don't know, we'll talk. Yeah. And actually I brought you a gift. Oh, a gift. Yeah, I was gonna save this for the end, but this seems fitting. Here's your toolbox, your thrifty <gasps> toolbox. This is my cookbook. Yes. And it kind of teaches you about food prep and a number of other things in there. So make sure we get a good shot of this on oh, this camera right here. Look at that. Look at that juggling. So what, I'm curious, what happened if we if this were a video and we hit play, what happens to that orange when we hit play? Oh, I was tossing that sucker. That is not photoshopped. <laughs> yeah. I actually tried juggling in a couple of pictures and it didn't go well. I so love that. We had orange juice all over oh, the Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Yeah. To check so that maybe out. that will help. But I'm gonna let's set it up here so it's in the shot. You know what? We don't need to do that. No, that's what I'm gonna do. Getting that. enough of Jordan's face. Yeah, no, that's okay. All right. That's that very works. nice. Okay. All right. That was that was a pretty good answer. I'm sorry, I get very excited about talking about the passion. Kind of that's stuff. what we want here. P.S. I still don't like cooking, for the record. And I have four more cookbooks coming out in the fall. I do not like it, but my why is bigger than how much I don't like cooking and especially don't like dishes. So it's possible if I can do it, you can do it. I love that so much. All right, scenario two, we're gonna transition to personal finance. Ooh, okay. Something you knew a little bit about here. So someone is in debt. Okay. And we're just gonna say some hypothetical person. We're not talking about the 60 to 70% of Americans that don't even have $1,000 in their savings. We're just saying, hypothetically, someone is in debt. Um, They do not know where to start. I, I have been fortunate to have been frankly taught like how to manage debt effectively, but having had a small glimpse of debt in moments throughout my life, it is crushing. It, it like it, 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 it is a mental and emotional toll. I, I can't even imagine that would feel like magnified. Yeah. So, so I empathize greatly with someone who is under that burden and, and frankly understand why they would stay there. Right. If you're sitting under a boulder, like the last thing you think about is like, well, if I touch it or push it, it's going to move at all. Right. Where do you start? It's hard. And I've been there too. There was a point where our debt on our credit cards, just it did, the math didn't work with the amount of money we were making. If you've got $15,000 on credit cards and your entire annual income is $31,000, that that's just a life you sign up for is what I was thinking. Like, wow, I didn't think we'd be those people, but I guess we're those people that just always has a balance on our credit cards. And and it really took me waking up one day and it was this kind of movie moment where I looked in the mirror and I was like, can I cuss on your podcast? Yeah, well, okay. go right ahead. I was like, damn it, Jordan, you aren't better than this. You know, you do not have to just give in, just get up and figure it out. And we did. So I would say, get up and figure it out. You can do it. First things first though, yeah, don't worry about savings. Get $1,000 into savings. That's funny because that's my number. I don't know where you yeah. got that statistic, but it's a real statistic. Get $1,000 into your savings. And then from there, we are just going to attack the credit cards first. That tends to be where the debt is most expensive, where it's 
kind of the sexiest debt because you get something really fun in exchange usually, like you're buying things. Let's just tackle that. Um, and you're going to freeze your credit cards in a cup of water, like literally freeze them so you don't have them with you and then erase them from your phone so that your keychain in your phone does not remember them. And then you give yourself a budget every week with cash. And it's just temporary just to get you in the habit of knowing that you can still spend. You can still spend money. Just make your choice. Maybe you give yourself 200 bucks a week to spend on whatever you want. Okay, well, if you want to go out and do a lot of fun, that will be gone really fast. Or maybe you cook food at home and you use that for groceries and then you go do some free date nights. But give yourself some spending money, make some choices. Um, and then the number one thing I would say is, and this is why I've started this shelf cooking brand and everything about it, is because a lot of what we overspend on is food. It's not necessarily the big trips, the big cars, the mortgage, of course, like make wise decisions. It's the day-to-day expenses, mostly with food. So most Americans spend more than their mortgage on food that they usually don't even end up fully eating. We throw away more than half of it. So cut it back, just cook at home, and then try spending cash for a little bit and then move to debit cards, and then you can thaw out those credit cards and try again. But food is a really important place to start. Why do I feel like Rad in our food prep example was maybe someone that on occasion spends more in food than his mortgage every month? Oh, you know what? Rad is not alone. <laughs> a lot of us do. A lot of us do. And this is the one thing that I'll say. And by the way, there is so much more to the whole budgeting talk. Like you got to find your motivation first. And then of course you got to cut back on things. But um, I have a lot of resources online that can help. And the one thing that I just wish I could just grab everybody by the shoulders and be like, you don't have to figure this out alone. I did. I literally felt alone back in 2007, 8, 9, 10 when I was doing this. But now it's like, don't put that stress on yourself. I can help. The internet can help. YouTube can help. Find someone that speaks to you. If it's not me, go find someone and just one thing at a time. But you got to get off your butt and tackle it. Okay, which is actually a perfect segue into the last scenario here. It's a productivity scenario. Mm, okay. So as we talk about building a dream, um, it is, especially here at the podcast, we we have a mantra around sustainable intensity, and because you 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 have to have a level of intensity to to not only create momentum but keep it going. But burnout's a real thing, and if if you do not manage your time and your bandwidth and your mental, physical, and emotional capacity, you will burn out and it will be a painful, fiery death. (laughs) So for someone feeling overwhelmed, like in in their mind, they know all the things that they need to do, whether that's starting or building a business, whether that's cleaning the house, like they, they are very aware of everything that's going on. The dishes are not done. This hasn't been vacuumed. This isn't put away. Um, maybe it's organizing the garage, whatever it might be, someone feeling overwhelmed by all of the nagging tasks on their to-do list, and they are suffering from this analysis paralysis, how do they then go and get out of this funk to start making a decision to start somewhere? Yeah. Okay, Brad, how do you eat an elephant? Do you know this one? Do you know the answer to that? Rumor has it, and this is just a rumor. Okay. It's a bite at a time. (sighs) I'm so proud of you. Yes. And that's what I tell people is you can't look at someone and say, get your ish together, go clean your garage, make your kids not a brat anymore. Like stop spending money. That's too overwhelming. Our brains literally haywire and shut down. That's like opening an old computer that's been processing a certain way, just banging on the keys. That's just not how anything operates in life. Why would we think our brains would operate properly that way? So one little thing. And what I tell people in my productivity bootcamp is we actually are going to start by focusing on what hurts the most. Sometimes like when professional organizers come in, they just want everything to like look pretty and look beautiful. And, but I feel like the underlying issue is, well, how did it get here in the first place? You know? So we're going to focus on what hurts the most. What are your biggest pain points? Pain is a gift and you focus on it. And then, so let's say my biggest pain point is I cannot keep up with the messes in my house, which remember eight kids in 10 years, like we have a lot of messes in our house. So I would look at it and say, okay, I cannot keep up. What is it that hurts? And I was like, well, there's always dishes in the sink or the kids' shoes are everywhere. 
So that's great. So instead of saying, I need to clean my whole house, maybe just say, well, what in my house isn't working? What hurts? And pick one little thing. And it's like dishes. Great. Let's come up with one system for dishes. What isn't working about the dishes? Well, I don't have time to get to them. Great. Well, you're married and you have kids. Like, why are you responsible for everybody's dishes? Maybe we need to make a system that works for everyone. So in our house, we moved all the dishes down to the bottom level. Sadie Jane is going to rock at dishes someday, I promise. So we just, instead of, which is weird when people come over, they're looking for silverware and bowls where they normally would be, but we moved everything down so they could reach them so they could put things away. So now we taught them on down to four. They start at four years old to empty the dishwasher, put everything away because they can reach it. And then we have this rotation. And that's what I would say is start with a pain point one bite at a time. Um, and then in general, just a productivity tip for anyone, including yourself, which brings me to gift number two. Number two. Dun, 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 dun. I brought you wow. your very own productivity planner, a block schedule planner. I love the colors. I thought of you. And then I I, I actually brought one for your wife as oh, well. So she will love those colors. Yeah. So yeah, I tell have, me about this. If you can't tell, I have ADHD big time. And it's very hard for me because my brain physically doesn't filter and prioritize tasks. Everything hits me at once and I'm a great multitasker kind of, except nothing gets done. And so what I found is I had to take my day and break it into blocks like you would have in high school or college where you're like, okay, I wake up and I have this time to get ready. And then I have my first class, which is math. And I only do math during math class, but then the bell rings. And then I go to science and I only do science and then it's lunch. And then, oh, and then it's soccer and then it's vocal performance, whatever. Why? as adults, do we stop giving everything its turn? We just kind of feel like we have to do everything all the time and it it's impossible. So give yourself, maybe the morning is when you have your meditation time, your exercise time, your, I'm gonna privately eat nachos in my car time. And then it's like, all right, morning is for the kids. Afternoon is when I get work done. Evening is family time. Nighttime is when I lose myself on my phone on Instagram. Give everything its place so that you don't feel like you have to do it all, all the time. So dishes, do them like once, maybe twice a day, and then otherwise just forget about it and don't feel like you're always- here's, here's what's so interesting about that. I was literally talking with a close friend of mine last week, and we were, we were talking about just how different life is as an adult, meaning, and I, I would classify like being truly an adult, like after- you're no longer in in school. Like, sure. like you don't have like a structured schedule. On your own. Uh -huh. When all of a sudden you wake up every day and what you do that day is 100% because you chose to do it. Mm -hmm. And and I kind of went through this, we'll call it post-graduation crisis where for my entire life, there was always another class to go to. There was always another assignment given. There was always another test to prepare for. And now all of a sudden I'm in the workforce. I'm doing something that I signed up for and I could keep doing that same thing every day over and over for the rest of my life, unless I choose to do something else. Mm -hmm. And I think that resonates with me and probably with a lot of people. Like this structure is helpful because as adults, like we you don't only naturally have, have it. Yeah. Unless, unless we decide like, right. here's the structure. Yeah. So that is awesome. And especially life looks a little different now. A lot of us maybe have a full-time job, but it's at home and you know, it's like, it's easy to get distracted by things, or maybe we're entrepreneurs that that have a weird schedule, or what do you do with yourself on a Saturday or a Sunday? Are you really utilizing your time? But this is mostly for the women in the room, not to be sexist, but we carry a lot of guilt, mom guilt, that for me, it's like, well, I'm guilty that there's dishes in the sink, but I'm also guilty that that I'm playing with my kids, you know, or not playing with my kids. You can't win. And so it's like, give everything its place. You are not worried about soccer practice in math class when you're in high school. That's why you're, you are a good soccer player in high school or good at math in high school. You are not doing your homework while you're getting ready for school in the morning or hopefully not. You know, everything has its place and that's what allows your brain to log in and focus and then log out and focus. And I literally have alarms set. I had to turn off like four of them being here um, because it's like, oh, it's family time. Oh, it's work time. Oh, it's clean the house time. And then when the bell rings, you move on. And if you didn't get to it, whatever, there's always tomorrow. Well, that's literally why I built this office because I found back in 2020 when I was working another job, I was 
you know, on my laptop, on the couch, up in the bed, out on, on it never the turns deck. off. And, and yeah. it was just like, yeah, all of a sudden everywhere was work. Yeah. I come down here and this can be that yeah. place for me. And, and and that may not work for everybody, but for me, it works like to, to actually physically separate myself so I can go into work mode. I know that when I'm here, I'm doing yeah. certain things. I'm not doing other things. Right. Yeah. So that makes you're not down sense. here, like, you know, just working on your golf swing, you know, it's, it's, a, it's giving yourself permission to focus when it's appropriate to focus on that one thing and then to tuck it away and put it away to focus on the next thing. And our brains do not naturally do that. Like you said, our schedules did it for us from we when we were babies until through college and then we become adults. We're like, oh my gosh, <laughs> I can't do it. I, I don't know what I'm doing. And then that's why we sit there and we scroll our phones for four hours straight because it's just this escape mechanism. So this has been like a mutual therapy session. Yeah. I feel so seen right now. Oh, well, this is you great. know, we're in this together. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So as we wrap up, I want to um, dive a little bit deeper into the, the dream aspect. Obviously, this this podcast is called The Dreamer's Den, mm -hmm. a podcast about daring to dream. Now, while you started your journey with no intention of creating it, at least originally, into what it has become today, at a certain point, you had a realization. This is turning into something special. I don't know if it was when you were sitting on the Rachel Ratio. I don't know when it's you had walked away with twenty five thousand dollars on the match game, whatever the case might be. Yeah, don't Google it. What was this? What was that point in time where you had to step back and realize, like, like in the most humble way possible, but like we're building something amazing. That is so hard. I still have trouble stopping and realizing it sometimes because it just feels so natural. I just stop and I think like, well, it's not, what I'm doing is not that cool. I'm just, I just want to help. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question. I will say um, there was a pivot point for me. And that was a year and a half after starting my blog when Bubba put Google analytics on there and was like, wow, baby, you, I mean, you've got some eyeballs on this stuff that I had to make a choice then. And it was actually a hard choice and one that I still struggle with, but that was, at the time, um, I was spending more and more time on this hobby. And I was using the word hobby as a safety net, where it was like, oh, this blog is just a hobby. It's just a hobby. Yet I was, my laptop was everywhere. Just like you said, I was up late at night. I was, because I, I, I could feel, you know, just through the comments and different things that people were really relying on me and needing me. And I loved it. And it felt good that what I was putting out there was working. But he sat me down and he said, um, we need to monetize this. And that was not exciting to me. And in fact, I said, no, I said, I don't want a job. I want this to be a hobby. It will make it not fun. It'll change everything. I'm going to hate it. And I fought it for a while. And he helped me to realize that, um, sometimes like there's no shame in taking a passion and monetizing it to turn it into a business because as long as you keep your why, as long as you stay grounded, as long as you keep what's most important in mind, then it does allow you to reach more people. And that was something that I had to really consciously choose. And I will tell you to this day, ask anyone on my team, ask anyone in my life, the business part of it is like such a bummer sometimes. I do not love running a business. I love helping people. As we close this up, I want to go to what we call our Dreamer's Digest. We're Ooh. just going to consolidate it down. Okay. Knowing what you know now. Okay. This is, I feel like this is a common question on a show like this, but it's important okay. because everyone's answer is going to be different. Knowing what you know now, if you could go back in time to the debt-ridden, struggling Jordan and Bubba, give them one piece of advice or encouragement with the perspective you have today, what mm. would that be? Oh, that is such a good question. I would tell them to not be afraid to do life your own way. I think initially a lot of the decisions we make as humans are fear-based decisions. If you really start to understand your fears and your insecurities and recognize them, they dictate everything. Why do you think so many of us have so much anxiety anymore? It's all anxiety is a fear-based reaction. And at the end of the day, it's like, if we could just melt away some of those fears and say, life is meant to be individualized. Life is meant to look different than everybody else. Life is meant to be experienced. And like Bubba just said, failures, 
there's nothing wrong with failures. I don't actually like the word failure. I just think they're learning experiences and learning opportunities. Um, I So I would look at us and say, be braver about doing life your way sooner. We're there now. We live life unabashedly now, but it has taken us many years to get there. And I think if I could have understood that much earlier, especially as like a teenager, and I'm seeing this in my own teenagers, I'm like, oh, here it comes, just the insecurities and the, you know, trying to find who you are. It's like, just, just be you and go for it. Everything else will work out. It really will. When it's like you said, you started to find true success when you just embraced who you were and what you did, yeah. paying no mind to those that that maybe you weren't for them because there were enough people that were for you. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I've um I, I haven't listened to a lot of podcasts, which is ironic because <laughs> we're running one here. You know why creators don't consume. That's yeah, why. There you go. Yeah. But I do remember one particular episode of some random podcast I came across. And I was listening to it at the gym and the quote always stuck with me. It said, if if you don't, and I'm paraphrasing it here, but if you don't lean into the gifts and talents that you've been given and embrace those fully, develop them and do them like passionately, you are literally doing this world a disservice. Yeah. So on behalf of everyone, men, women, children, anyone who's utilized shelf <laughs> cooking, the weekly block schedule, any of your online free tools. Thank you on behalf of all of them for being your best self, for bringing what only you can bring to the world. Uh, Once again, everybody, you've been listening to Jordan Page here on the Dreamers Den podcast. Jordan, where can people find you? Where can they learn more? Where can they go get your content? Thank you, by the way. Um, Well, come chat with me on Instagram at Jordan Page. No, I and Page. Um, Or thepagecompany.com is a good home base where you can find all my things. Okay. Awesome. Definitely have them check it out. This has been awesome. It's been fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. I mean, I'm a little salty that there's no nachos in here, but Which, next I mean, we've, time. We've still got time. We've got time? Okay. Yeah, we've got all time. Right. We'll talk about it. So if you've enjoyed today's podcast, everybody, we invite you to give us a follow across all social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. That's at Dreamers Den Podcast. And you can listen to all of our episodes by subscribing wherever you get your podcast. And while you're at it, don't forget to kindly rate and review the podcast, which not only helps us to reach more listeners, but improve the quality of the show. I'm going to be honest, this is going to be a hard one to beat. Oh, This has been awesome. Thank you. So on behalf of the entire Dream Team, I'm Brad Robbins reminding you all to work hard, be kind, and always dare to dream.